Hello and welcome to a brief journey through the solar system. My name is Fulvia Fiorani. For those who have seen my cosmology lecture series, in which we explored the universe as a whole, in this lecture we will stay closer to home and remain within our own solar system. As this is a brief journey, we will superficially cover many topics, many of which are covered in greater detail in some of my other lectures. My hope is that you will enjoy this overview, perhaps learn something new, and that it may stimulate further interest in other aspects of our amazing universe. So let's see what we will cover as we journey through our solar system. We start with the formation of the solar system, when and how it formed. We will define the various bodies within the solar system. And then we'll go over a brief historical perspective of the study of our solar system. We will then talk about planetary motion about the Sun and spend a little bit of time on Earth's motion and its effects. The next topic will be our closest neighbor, the Moon, and briefly mention eclipses, both solar and lunar. Then we take a look at our very own star, the Sun, the dominant object in our solar system. The Sun and our solar system will not last forever, so we'll take a look at its eventual end. We start our journey about 4.6 billion years ago. Our solar system formed from an initially slowly rotating interstellar cloud of gas and dust. This cloud is called a nebula, from the Latin word for cloud. As the cloud gravitationally collapses under the effect of its own gravity, it spins faster and faster. In physics terms, this is called the law of conservation of angular momentum. But the best way to understand this is the example of an ice skater. The ice skater starts a spin slowly with his or her arms stretched out, and as the arms are brought in closer to the body, the spin gets faster and faster. Now, spinning objects tend to get flung out away from their axes of rotation, just like loose clothing on an ice skater. So as the cloud continues to collapse, it's spinning faster and faster, and some of the material is being flung out and flattening into a disk. Most of the material, mostly hydrogen, collapses towards the center, forming the protosun, which continues to increase in pressure and temperature. In the meantime, the material in the disk coalesces and clumps together to form planetesimals, protoplanets, and eventually planets. When the mass, temperature, and pressure in the core of the protosun is high enough to ignite nuclear fusion, the sun is born. The resulting blast of solar wind and radiation sweeps through the newly formed system, clearing out most of the remaining dust. And what remains is a fully formed solar system with all the planets revolving in the same direction and approximately on the same plane around the central sun. Our solar system has eight planets, five dwarf planets, and various other small bodies such as asteroids, comets, and other natural satellites. Until 2006, there had been no official definition for the various solar system bodies. So in August of 2006, the International Astronomical Union defined three categories of solar system bodies. A planet is a celestial body that is in orbit around the sun. It has sufficient mass for its self-gravity to overcome rigid body forces so that it assumes a nearly round shape. And it has cleared the neighborhood around its orbit. In other words, it has become the gravitationally dominant object in its orbit. The eight planets are Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. A dwarf planet is a celestial body that, like a planet, is in orbit around the Sun. It has sufficient mass for its self-gravity to overcome rigid body forces so that it assumes a nearly round shape. However, it has not cleared the neighborhood around its orbit. In other words, it is not the gravitationally dominant body in its orbit. 
By definition, this is the difference between a planet and a dwarf planet. And of course, it is not a satellite of a planet. There are currently five dwarf planets, Pluto, Ceres, Eris, Haumea, and Makimaki. But other known bodies might be reclassified as dwarf planets in the near future. All other objects, except satellites orbiting the sun, are referred to collectively as small solar system bodies. These objects currently include asteroids, most trans-Neptunian objects, comets, and other small bodies. Now, Pluto does not qualify as a planet because it has not cleared the neighborhood of its own orbit. Pluto is now classified as a dwarf planet and is recognized as the prototype of a new category of trans-Neptunian objects. In a few slides, we'll see how Pluto really doesn't fit with the other planets. Planets are divided into two groups, the terrestrial planets, which we see here, and the Jovian planets, which we will see in the next slide. Now, I will not go into details of each of the planets in this lecture, since they are the subject of an upcoming lecture. So I'll just cover some general characteristics of each of the groupings. The terrestrial planets are called terrestrial because they are Earth-like in many characteristics. They are formed from the high-density material near the center of the solar nebula, or those closest to the sun. They are relatively small and very dense, and they all have an iron core. And they are sometimes referred to as the inner planets. Here we have the Jovian planets, or Jupiter-like planets. Earth is included in the corner for size comparison. Unlike terrestrial planets, the Jovian planets were formed from the low-density materials that were flung far out towards the outer edge of the solar nebula. Since they formed from low-density material, they are all very large and gaseous. And they all have rings, although Saturn has the most prominent and famous ones. And they are also referred to as outer planets. Other solar system bodies include dwarf planets. Here we see Pluto, as imaged by New Horizons in July of 2015, and Ceres, as imaged by the Dawn spacecraft in May of 2015. The next are asteroids, found mostly between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Here we see Vesta, which is on the short list for dwarf planet designation. And we also see other various smaller asteroids. In addition, we have trans-Neptunian objects, comets, and other small bodies. We'll talk more about all of these in an upcoming lecture. As we talk about our solar system, it's nice to have a bit of a historical perspective. Ancient civilizations such as Mesopotamia, Babylon, Egypt, and the Maya mostly made celestial observations for a practical nature. They observed the motions of the sun, the moon, and the planets to create calendars to remind them of important annual events, such as when to plant and harvest crops. They also made observations of the stars to assist in navigation. Some observations were of an astrological nature, or the study of how the relative positions of various celestial bodies would influence human affairs. Now, some cultures left behind extensive documents, while others left behind structures with significant astronomical alignments. Among, among some of the most famous are Stonehenge in England, the Great Pyramids of Giza in Egypt, and the Mayan Caracol in Chichen Itza, Mexico. Now, while the study of these ancient civilizations can be very interesting, our modern astronomy and cosmology derives from the ideas of the ancient Greek philosophers and astronomers. The preeminent Greek philosopher is Aristotle. We'll talk more about his view of the universe in the next slide, but for now, I want to mention him in the context of the spherical Earth. The earliest mention of a spherical Earth comes from the ancient Greek sources that predate Aristotle, but he made some very convincing arguments. 
By observing that the Earth's shadow during a lunar eclipse always projected an arc on the moon, he deduced that the Earth must be a sphere. He also observed that the positions of stars in the sky are visible at different latitudes on Earth, but at the same longitude and time. He argued that this could only be possible on a round Earth. And of course, ships coming from far away appeared to come up from the horizon. So by the time of Aristotle, the fact that the Earth was spherical was a very well-established fact. Continuing with the ancient Greeks, we have Aristarchus of Samos. By measuring the angle between the moon, the sun, and the Earth during the phases of the moon, he was able to calculate the distance to the moon and the sun. Although his calculations were off, his approach was correct. And through his measurements, he correctly deduced that the sun is very large and distant. And he reasoned that since the sun was considerably larger than Earth, it was probably the dominant object in the universe. Of course, today we know that the sun is just an average star, but it is the most dominant object in our solar system. Aristarchus was the first to put forth a heliocentric hypothesis that the Earth and the planets orbited the sun. Unfortunately, his radical theory was not accepted at the time and was rejected in favor of the more common sense Aristotelian system. But 1700 years later, Copernicus would attribute his heliocentric theory to Aristarchus. Next we have Eratosthenes. He famously determined the circumference of the Earth. His method was quite ingenious. He noticed that at noon, on the summer solstice, a stick in the ground in Syene did not cast a shadow. In other words, the sun was directly overhead. At the same time, on the same day, he noticed that a stick in Alexandria, which he knew to be about 18, 800 kilometers away, cast a shadow of about 7 degrees to the vertical. Now, geometry of parallel lines tells us that these two angles are the same. So using simple geometry and proportions, he was able to use these to calculate the circumference of the Earth. Since he knew the distance between Syene and Alexandria to be 800 kilometers, he could set the ratio of the distances equal to the ratios of the angles, and therefore simply calculate the circumference of the Earth. Although we are not certain of his units, his methodology was correct, and he was able to calculate the circumference to within 9 to 16 percent of today's value. Lastly, we come to Hipparchus. He is perhaps the greatest astronomer in antiquity. He refined Aristarchus's distance to the moon to within 2 percent error of the actual value. He determined the length of the year to within 6 minutes, and he made the first accurate catalog of 850 stars, including their positions and apparent brightness. His measurements were so accurate that he noticed that the direction of the North Celestial Pole gradually changes with time. We will talk more about this in a few slides. To the ancient Greeks, such as Aristotle, the universe was perfect, it was finite, and very importantly, it was Earth-centered. A centered and stationary Earth made a lot of sense at the time. After all, as seen from Earth, the stars, the sun, the moon, and the planets all seemed to rise in the east and set in the west. So it was natural to think that everything moved around the Earth. The moon and planets were also observed to slowly move from west to east among the backdrop of fixed stars from night to night. And sometimes the planets were seen to stop in their forward motion, reverse their direction of travel for a while, then resume their forward motion. This is what we call apparent retrograde motion of planets. So there's a lot of motion as seen from Earth. Now Aristotle developed a system to make sense of all this motion. According to Aristotle, the universe is made of concentric spheres with the stationary Earth at the center and the firmament of fixed stars 
on the outer sphere. The sun, moon, and planets each were embedded in their own spheres. And to make sense of and to account for all the various motions, the Aristotelian system had 55 nested spheres all influencing each other's motions. Needless to say, this was a very complex system and had very limited predictive powers. In other words, the system was not able to accurately predict the position of celestial bodies as a function of time. About 400 years later, the great Greco-Roman astrologer, astronomer, and mathematician Ptolemy came along and produced a system that, although still Earth-centered, was much less complex than Aristotle's. And more importantly, it had much better predictive powers. This is a diagram of the Ptolemaic system, where we see the Earth at the center and all other known bodies moving around the Earth. We also see that each of the planets also move along smaller circles called epicycles. Ptolemy had to introduce epicycles to explain the apparent retrograde motion of planets. Although it is still a fairly complex system, it was very accurate at predicting the position of planets as a function of time. It was such an accurate system that it was used for almost 1,500 years until Copernicus came along. In 1514, Nicholas Copernicus revolutionized astronomy by proposing a heliocentric model. Recall that almost 2,000 years earlier, Aristarchus had first suggested a heliocentric system, but that was not the system that came down to us from the ancient world. Heliocentric, of course, means sun-centered. According to this model, the Earth and the five other known planets at the time, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, revolve around the Sun. It was a beautiful and elegant theory that was much less complex than Ptolemy's. However, the theory's power to predict the position of planets was no better than that of Ptolemy's. Less complex, yes, but the predictive power was no less. There was really no evidence that the Earth was moving. After all, from the point of view of an observer on Earth, we certainly do not seem to be moving. And then it contradicted the Bible, which at the time was considered not only to contain theological truth, but scientific truth as well. Of course, most of us today do not consider the Bible to be a science book. In fact, one of my favorite sayings is, the Bible teaches us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. So needless to say, Copernicus's theory was not accepted by many during his time. It was not until later, in the early 1600s, that Galileo was able to observationally prove that the heliocentric theory was correct. So let's take a look at Galileo's two great discoveries that proved the Copernican system. First, a couple of words on Galileo. He is considered the father of modern astronomy, not because he was the first to look upward into the sky and try to figure things out, there were certainly many before him, but because he was the first to use a telescope to study the heavens. In 1610, he published the first ever recorded telescopic astronomical observations in a publication called Siderius Nuncius, otherwise known as the starry messenger. So what were the two great discoveries that proved the heliocentric system? The first was the moons of Jupiter. In 1610, Galileo observed what he described as three fixed stars all close to Jupiter and lying in a straight line through it. Observations on subsequent nights showed that the positions of these fixed stars were changing relative to Jupiter. Therefore, they could not have been fixed stars. These are the sketches published in the Starry Messenger showing the different positions of the stars relative to Jupiter. During one observation, one of the stars had disappeared behind Jupiter. Then later he observed a fourth star. Within a few days he concluded that these bodies were orbiting Jupiter. 
Now these observations went against Aristotelian cosmology that all heavenly bodies should circle the earth. This was the first time that heavenly bodies were seen to circle each other and not the earth. This is Jupiter seen through a small telescope. Even today, this is a beautiful sight to see. The second set of observations supporting the Sun-centered model were the phases of Venus. Starting in September of 1610, Galileo observed that Venus exhibited a full set of phases similar to that of the Moon, as seen in these sketches. The Copernican heliocentric model predicted that all the phases would be visible as Venus orbited the Sun, and this was not possible with the Ptolemaic or the Earth-centered model. This is a composite image of Venus taken in 2004, and the phases of Venus can easily be seen with a small backyard telescope. Galileo made two other planetary discoveries of interest, although they are not in support of the heliocentric model. The first was the rings of Saturn. In 1610, he first mistook the rings as planets, thinking it was a three-body system. When he observed Saturn again in 1612, the two bodies had mysteriously disappeared. His telescope was not powerful enough to see the rings when they are edge-on toward Earth. Then in 1616, Galileo again observed Saturn, and now they had reappeared. By this time, the rings were facing Earth and were easier to see. Galileo was never able to identify these as rings. Better telescopes were needed for that. And at one point, Galileo called the rings the ears of Saturn. Galileo was also the first to observe the planet Neptune. However, he did not recognize it as a planet, so he's not credited with its discovery. We will talk about the beautiful and amazing discovery of Neptune in a few slides. Neptune appears in Galileo's notebooks as one of many unremarkable dim stars. However, he did mark its motion relative to the other stars, and that is how we know that he was the first to observe it, even though he did not recognize it as a planet. Of course, we all know that today that the heliocentric theory is correct. The Earth and all the other planets revolve around the Sun. So Copernicus's theory was correct, but his model was slightly wrong. In his model, the planets moved in circular orbits around the Sun. We know today that the orbits are actually elliptical, as we will see in a couple of slides, with the Sun in one focus of the ellipse. And although his system easily explained the apparent retrograde motion of planets, he still introduced epicycles to fine-tune his theoretical predictions with actual observations. But all in all, Copernicus had a wonderful sense of the organization of our solar system. And here is our current model today, with the Sun at the center and the eight planets revolving around the Sun, all in the same direction, and approximately on the same plane. Now, although no longer called a planet, I'd like to add Pluto's orbit to this picture. As you can see, Pluto's orbit doesn't quite fit with the other planets. Its orbit is very inclined compared to the orbital planes of the other planets, and it is also more eccentric, or it is much more elongated compared to the nearly circular orbits of the other planets. Pluto is also very small and dense, while the other outer planets are large and gaseous. So, as the Sesame Street song goes, one of these things is not like the other. Let's now explore the orbital motion of planets and later some of the phenomena associated with this motion. In the early 1600s, a German mathematician, Johannes Kepler, derived three empirical laws of planetary motion, and thereby, thereby refining the Copernican system. The first law, also known as the law of ellipses, states that the path of a planet orbiting the sun is an ellipse, with the sun in one focus of the ellipse. 
Now please note that the elliptical path in this figure is greatly exaggerated for illustration purposes only. The actual elliptical paths are nearly circular. The second law, also known as the law of equal areas, states that a planet moves such that a line drawn from the sun to the planet sweeps an equal area in equal time. What this basically means is that a planet moves faster when closest to the sun and slower when farther away. The third law, also known as the law of harmonies or periods, states that the square of a planet's period, or the time for one complete revolution, is proportional to the cube of its average distance to the sun. Okay, so that's a bit of a mouthful. So what does it actually mean? Well, in its full equation format, not presented here, it allows us to calculate the distance of any planet based on its observed period. In other words, if we can measure how long it takes a planet to make one complete revolution around the sun, we can calculate how far it is. Another wonderful outcome of this law is that it allows us to calculate the mass of the sun given a planet's distance and period. Okay, so we know that the planets revolve around the sun, but what keeps them in their orbit? Why don't they just fly out into space? Well, the answer, of course, is gravity. So now for just a little bit of physics. For any body to remain in circular motion, there must be a force acting on that body that is directed towards the center of rotation. An example is a ball on a string. It is the force of tension transmitted through the string that keeps the ball in circular motion. We all know what will happen if we let go of the string. The ball will continue its motion in a straight line. So what is the force that keeps planets in orbital motion about the sun? Well, the central or centripetal force is the attractive gravitational force between the sun and the planets. So what is this gravitational force and how does it work? In 1687, Isaac Newton developed his famous law of universal gravitation. So what does this equation mean? Well, the attractive gravitational force, F, between any two bodies or masses is proportional to the product of their masses, m1 and m2, and inversely proportional to the square of their distance, r. So the larger the masses, the stronger the attractive force, and the greater the distance between the masses, the weaker the force. G is called the gravitational constant. And as you can see, it is a very small number. This tells us that the gravitational force is actually a very weak force. It is only when large masses are involved that its effects are noticed. Now earlier I promised you the story of Neptune's discovery. It is a beautiful application of Newton's law. <coughs> Neptune was the first planet to be discovered based on the prediction of its existence. Shortly after Uranus was discovered in 1781, astronomers noticed deviation in its predicted orbit. Eventually, they concluded that there must be another planet farther away causing the apparent gravitational perturbations. And based on their data, they aimed their telescope at the calculated location, and lo and behold, they found the new planet. So Neptune was predicted to exist based on the laws of physics, and then it was discovered as predicted. Here is a chart with some basic planetary data. They are listed in the familiar order of distance from the sun. The next column is their orbital period, or the length of time to complete one revolution around the sun. These values are expressed in Earth years, and of course, Earth's orbital period is the definition of our year. As you would expect, the farther from the sun, the greater the distance to travel, and therefore the longer their orbital period. But not only does their orbital period increase because they travel a longer distance, but as you can see in this column, 
their orbital speed decreases as their distance from the sun increases. This is due to the decreasing force of gravity between each planet and the sun as their distance from the sun increases. Recall that the gravitational force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. So since the force of gravity is less with increasing distance from the sun, the speed required to stay in orbit is also less. The last column is the size of each planet. Now, although the images on the left are not to scale, notice the difference between the actual sizes of the inner and outer planets. Earth is the largest of the inner planets, while the outer planets are 4 to 11 times the size of Earth. Now let's take a look at some of the effects of planetary motion. One of the effects is the apparent retrograde motion of planets. Occasionally, planets seem to slow to a stop, go backwards along their paths, then resume their forward motion. This optical illusion is caused by the different orbital speeds as an inner planet catches up and passes an outer planet. So here we see Earth orbiting at 66,000 miles per hour and Mars orbiting at 54,000 miles per hour. As Earth is catching up to Mars, Mars will appear at this point in the sky. We follow the motion as the two planets orbit the Sun. Here we see that Earth has caught up to Mars, and now Mars appears behind its previous position, and continues to go backward until it starts moving forward again. So as seen from Earth, Mars makes a zigzag path through the sky. Here is an actual superimposed photo of Mars exhibiting retrograde motion. And depending on the tilt of their orbits and where they are in their orbits, sometimes Mars will appear to make a loop in the sky. Now let's take a look at Earth's orbit in a bit more detail. As with all other planets, the Earth's orbit around the Sun is an ellipse with the Sun in one focus. And once again, this ellipse is very exaggerated, but it's visually easier to explain. The point on its orbit farthest from the Sun is called the aphelion. The point closest to the Sun is called the perihelion. Of course, we all know the time it takes the Earth to complete one revolution around the Sun is what we define as a year. The extra quarter day is why we have a leap year every four years. Now you might notice that it is not exactly a quarter or 0.25 days, but our calendar does account for the slight difference by eliminating three days over a four-year period. So does our summer occur when the Earth is closest to the sun or farthest away? The answer is farthest away, at least during our current age. So let's see why. First, we notice that the Earth's axis is tilted 23.5 degrees with respect to its orbital plane. Because of this tilt, we see that during summer, the northern hemisphere receives more direct rays, therefore more heating. Also, the sun remains higher and longer above the horizon, so we have longer days with more heating. We also see that the southern hemisphere receives less direct sunlight, the sun is lower in the sky, so shorter days with less heating. Now, as you can see, during winter, the reverse occurs. The southern hemisphere has more direct sunlight, therefore more heating, and the northern hemisphere has less direct sunlight, therefore less heating. So the seasons are due to the inclination of the Earth's axis and depends on Earth's relative position as it orbits the sun. Now, we know that it is the Earth that orbits the Sun. However, as seen from Earth, it appears that the Sun makes a path through the sky over the course of a year. So let's take a look at this apparent path. First, I'll throw some constellations up into the sky. Some of you may recognize these as the 12 zodiac constellations. On March 21st, as seen from Earth, the Sun appears to be in the constellation Pisces. 
As the Earth moves around the Sun, the Sun will appear in different parts of the sky. April 21st in Aries, May 21st in Taurus, June 21st in Gemini, and so on and so forth as the Earth goes around the Sun over the course of a year. On February 21st, the Sun appears in Aquarius. So that means that Aquarius will be in the sky during the day. So if you want to see your zodiacal constellation in the night sky, you need to look six months before or after your birthday. Now this is the actual position of the Earth as it orbits the Sun. And this is the path that the Sun appears to make as seen from Earth. This apparent path is called the ecliptic. The ring of constellations through which the Sun appears to move through is called the zodiac. Now for this lecture, the zodiac is not important to remember, but the ecliptic is. Now we briefly talked about summer and winter. Now let's take a look at a more detailed picture of how the seasons are determined. Now for simplicity, we place the Earth's axis straight and then we tilt its path. The celestial equator is the projection of the Earth's equator onto the celestial sphere. The ecliptic, as we have just seen, is the apparent path of the Sun through the sky over the course of a year. The summer solstice is the first day of summer, occurs when the Sun is at the highest point above the celestial equator on or about June 21st. Solstice means stationary sun. So the sun reaches its highest point in the sky during the course of the year, and then it starts to lower. The winter solstice, or the first day of winter, occurs when the sun is at the lowest point below the celestial equator, on or about December 21st. The autumnal equinox, the first day of fall, occurs when the Sun is at the point of intersection of the ecliptic and the celestial equator as we go from summer to winter, which occurs on or about September 22nd. Equinox means equal night, or 12 hours each of day and night. The vernal equinox, or the first day of spring, occurs when the Sun is at the point of intersection of the ecliptic and the celestial equator as we go from winter to summer, on or about March 20th. Now the vernal equinox is an important astronomical reference point. It determines the current astronomical age. We are currently in the age of Pisces. It is also used to determine the date of Easter in the Western Church. Easter is the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. Now we've just talked about the Earth's motion around the Sun, but the Earth also rotates about its own axis. Now we all know that it is the Earth's rotation about its axis that gives us night and day. Of course, the side of the Earth facing the Sun is day, while the other side is night as we pass into the Earth's own shadow. Now Earth rotates from west to east, and since we are on Earth as it rotates, everything seems to rotate around us from east to west. And this is why the Sun appears to rise in the east and set in the west. Now as the Earth rotates on its axis, it undergoes what is known as precession. In other words, the Earth wobbles. An example of precession is a spinning top. I'm sure you've all seen that as a top spins, it also wobbles a bit. And so too the Earth. As it rotates or spins on its axis, it too wobbles. It takes the Earth 26,000 years to go through one complete wobble. Here we see Earth in its current orientation. 13,000 years from now, it will complete one half of its wobble so the axis will be pointing 180 degrees from its current orientation. So what does that mean to us? Well, today our north axis is pointing towards the north star, Polaris. About 12,000 years from now, our north axis will be pointing towards the star, Vega. 
And 5,000 years ago, around the time of the ancient pyramids were built, the North Star was Thuban. So as the Earth wobbles on its axis, our orientation in space is slowly changing. Another effect of the Earth's wobble is the precession of seasons or the precession of equinoxes. As an example, we take the first day of summer, June 21st, in the year 2000 in the Northern Hemisphere. We see that the North axis is inclined towards the Sun. 13,000 years from now, the axis will be pointing away from the Sun. So June 21st of the year 15,000 will be the first day of winter. Now, although this is a slow effect, we see that because of Earth's precession, our seasons change through the millennia. And now for just a little bit of trivia. Some of you may remember the 1960s song, The Dawning of the Age of Aquarius. Besides its possible astrological and New Age meaning, let's take a look at it, the actual astronomical meaning. A couple of slides ago, I mentioned that the position of the vernal equinox with respect to the background stars determines the current astronomical age. The precession of Earth's axis causes the vernal equinox to slowly shift its position relative to the background stars. The vernal equinox is currently in the constellation Pisces, so we are currently in the astronomical age of Pisces. Around the year 2400, the vernal equinox will be in the constellation Aquarius, and therefore the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Now we take a brief look at our closest neighbor, the Moon. Of course, we know it is our only natural satellite. Here is some basic lunar data. The Moon is about the same age of the Earth, four and a half billion years old. Its diameter is approximately 25% that of Earth, although its mass is only about 1% of the Earth's. The distance from Earth is about 240,000 miles, and its orbital speed is about 2,300 miles. So how was the Earth formed? Well, there are a few theories, which means we really don't know. But the most dominant theory seems to be the giant impact theory. According to this theory, shortly after the Earth formed, a large body, possibly the size of Mars, collided with the Earth melting the surface rocks. The moon then formed from the debris from the collision. In other words, it formed from the ejected molted rock from the impact. This also explains why the composition of the moon is similar to the Earth's crust. And the collision may have also given Earth its axial tilt. The moon is in what is called synchronous rotation. This means that the time it takes to revolve around the Earth, called its orbital period, is the same time it takes to complete one rotation about its axis. This is why we always see the same face of the Moon. This is the side we see from Earth, and it is called the near side. The surface of the Moon is characterized by impact craters and maria, or seas, which are actually lava-filled craters. Maria is the plural of the Latin mare, which means sea. And early astronomers mistook these for actual seas. Although we cannot see the far side of the moon from Earth, it has been photographed from space. And we can see that it is much more heavily cratered than the near side. Now, as we all know, the moon undergoes phases as seen from Earth. This image, of course, is a composite image of the moon in its various phases. So let's see why we have the phases of the moon. The phases of the moon are due to the relative positions of the moon, the sun, and the earth in the sky. Now, like the earth, the moon is always half illuminated by the sun. No matter where the moon is in its orbit around the earth, half of it is always illuminated by the sun. The phases of the moon are the result of how much of the illuminated portion we see as the moon orbits the Earth. 
Now, as we see here, when the moon is in this position, we do not see any of the illuminated portion. So we have what we call a new moon. As the moon orbits, we start to see a little bit more of the illuminated portion. Here we have the waxing crescent, then we go to the first quarter, the waxing gibbous, and a full moon, when we see the full half portion of the illuminated moon. Then it starts to decrease to waning gibbous, third quarter, and waning crescent, before we start all over with a new moon. Now, it, it is a common misconception that the phases of the moon are caused by the shadow of the Earth on the moon. But as we see here, they are really caused by our perspective of the illuminated portion of the moon as the moon moves around the Earth. Eclipses are fascinating astronomical occurrences between the sun, the Earth, and the moon. Either by divine design or astronomical coincidence, we live in an era when the apparent size of the moon and the sun as seen from Earth is the same. It is because of this that we can observe such beautiful events. A total lunar eclipse occurs when the moon moves into the shadow of the Earth. Here is a beautiful lunar eclipse. A total lunar eclipse is not totally dark. It actually appears a coppery reddish-orange color. This is because light from the sun is bent or refracted through the Earth's atmosphere. The yellow-orange-red light goes through the atmosphere while the green-blue-violet light is scattered, similar to why we see reddish sunrises and sunsets. It is the filtering effect of the Earth's atmosphere that makes lunar eclipses so beautiful. A solar eclipse occurs when the moon moves between the Earth and the sun and their orbits are all on the same plane. As you can see, the moon produces a very small shadow on the Earth. A total solar eclipse will only be visible in that region. Other nearby regions will see a partial solar eclipse. This is a picture of a total solar eclipse. You can see that the moon completely blocks out the visible surface of the sun, called the photosphere, and that enables us to see the beautiful corona and solar flares. Now, almost everyone has seen, or at least has had the opportunity to see, a lunar eclipse from their own home, but one usually has to travel to see a total solar eclipse. Some people call themselves eclipse chasers and will travel the world to catch a total solar eclipse. The next total solar eclipse in the U.S. will occur on April 8th of 2024. This is the path of the Great American Eclipse of 2017. The path of totality crossed the entire United States, and this hadn't happened since 1918. I traveled to Garden Valley, Idaho to see this magnificent event and was very fortunate to have perfect weather. The moment of totality is truly breathtaking. This was taken in Idaho Falls, Idaho, and this one in Jackson, Wyoming. Words cannot quite describe the feeling of witnessing such an event. For those who have seen one, you know what I mean. For those who haven't, here is the path of totality for the next total solar eclipse that will be visible in the U.S. In the last three slides, we will talk about the sun. The sun is the star of our solar system. Star because it is a star in the literal sense, and star because it is at the center of our solar system. The sun is the largest object in the solar system. It contains 99.8% of all the mass in the solar system. Although it is the star of our solar system, the sun is an ordinary average star and is one of over 100 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy. So let's just take a look at some basic solar data. As mentioned earlier, the sun is approximately 5 billion years old and has another 5 billion more years to go. The sun's diameter is about 100 times the diameter of Earth 
and its mass is 300,000 times the mass of the Earth. By volume, you can fit one million Earths into the Sun. The core temperature is approximately 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. Nuclear fusion occurs at this temperature. The surface temperature is approximately 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And for an interesting bit of trivia, the tungsten filament in a 100 watt incandescent light bulb reaches about one third the surface temperature of the sun. Finally, and most importantly, the sun provides for practically all of the energy we require to live on Earth. So how does the sun generate all that energy? Well, the answer is nuclear fusion. But what is nuclear fusion, and how does it generate so much energy? Well, nuclear fusion is the fusing together of lighter elements into heavier ones, and in the process, a very large amount of energy is released. So let's take a look at how the sun actually does this. We will do just a little bit of physics, but I think you'll enjoy it. This is the proton-proton chain reaction that occurs in the core of the sun. But you will be happy to know that we will not go over all of these details. What we will see, however, is nuclear fusion in a nutshell. First of all, 75% of the sun is made of hydrogen. So we will start with four hydrogen nuclei, or simply four protons. Under the extremely high temperature and pressure in the sun's core, the four protons fuse together to form one helium nucleus, which is made of two protons and two neutrons. And in this process, a huge amount of energy is released. But we still haven't answered the question of where this energy comes from. Well, it turns out that the mass of the helium nucleus is a little less than the mass of the original four hydrogen nuclei. This means that in the fusion process, a small amount of mass is lost. Now here is the beauty. That little bit of lost mass is converted into energy using E equals mc squared, probably the most famous equation in physics and one of the most beautiful expressions in all of science. I'm sure that most, if not all of you, have seen this equation before. But maybe some of you might not have a true appreciation for what it means. So let's get to know it. What the equation means in words is that energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. Now c squared is simply a conversion factor, so let's put that aside for a moment. In essence, what this equation tells us is that mass and energy are equivalent. They are interchangeable. In other words, anything that has mass has an equivalent amount of energy and vice versa. Now let's look at the conversion factor c squared. c is the speed of light. Its value is 300 million meters per second. Now if you square 300 million, you get 90,000 trillion. That's a pretty big number. So that means that even a small amount of mass is equivalent to a huge amount of energy. So let's see an actual example. Every second, the sun converts about 600 million tons of hydrogen into 596 million tons of helium. That means that 4 million tons of mass is lost in the process. Now, we plug 4 million tons into E equals mc squared, and what we get is 400 trillion trillion watts. That's a 4 followed by 26 zeros. Now, we all know that's a huge number, but we really don't have an intuition for it. So in practical terms, this means that every second, the sun puts out what three billion of our most powerful power plants would put out in one year. Now, as a reference, we currently have about 8,000 power plants in the U.S. And once again, the sun puts out what three billion of our most power, powerful power plants would put out in a year. That is absolutely 
amazing. But what's even more amazing is that the sun will continue to put out that amount of energy every second for the next five billion years. But one day our sun will run out of fuel and our solar system as we know it will eventually come to an end. But not to worry, we still have about five billion years to go. The end of our solar system begins with the death of our own sun. All stars have a life cycle. They are born, they live a stable phase, and they eventually die. For more details on this life cycle, please see my lectures on stellar evolution. But very briefly, the sun is currently a main sequence star. It is halfway through its most stable phase in its life cycle. During this phase, it generates a large amount of energy by fusing hydrogen into helium in its core. And the sun will happily stay in this phase for another five billion years until it runs out of hydrogen in its core. At this point, the sun will start to collapse until it reignites new nuclear fusion reactions. When this happens, the sun will expand greatly in size, becoming what is known as a red giant. During the first red giant phase, the sun will expand out to the orbit of Mercury. And during the second red giant phase, it will likely expand out to Earth. With the sun being so big now, the outer layers of gas are very loosely gravitationally bound to the sun. So they start to drift away, becoming what is known as a planetary nebula. Eventually, as the nebula continues to spread out, the gases will completely drift away and incorporate into the surrounding interstellar space. And what is left is a very small and dense core called a white dwarf. There are no more nuclear reactions at this stage, so the sun can no longer generate energy, and the white dwarf sun will simply radiate its leftover energy and slowly fade away. The death of our sun marks the beginning of the end of our solar system. In the far distant future, some of the planets will be destroyed and some will be ejected out into interstellar space, very likely leaving our dead sun without any of its original planets. This ends our brief journey through the solar system. I hope you've enjoyed it and thank you for taking it with me.